ゲゲEpisode of Ganks is called Womp and Row Wow or Row Wow. I don't like seeing myself. I'm looking at myself. Um. So Womp, uh, they're both the same thing. Actually, Lee, I'm gonna look at you. Yeah, I know. Rather I mean, than look wait, at no, you. Right there. So you try to find the perfect way to make your guitar sound different. How about bass? Go on, you. go on. What are you, what are you saying? So, um, the basically, it's it's this episode is about using um, filters to for maximum effect. It's always it's always about using stuff for maximum effect when it comes out. But uh, basically, use filter to. Make sound sound like this. Make sound sound like this. Or like this. Or that one. Or this one. Sometimes it's that one. What about this one? This one. Oh, that's yeah. You can modulate it too, Lee. Right? Yeah. Very good. You've been to school, I can see. I went to school. Filter school. The first one we're going to talk about is using the filters in the song of ours, the the rains. Rain, the rain song. Rain. Uh, I, all I'm thinking about now is Phil Collins. Rain down. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Man, I was thinking about the weather. Okay. A lot of people think that we're talking about, like, rains. Like, but actually, we're talking about pulling on people's raincoats. The brand rains. <laughs> My part in that, we talked about this before. Um, we're repeating ourselves a lot in this episode. Repeat, basically, what we've discovered through creating this show is that I lack imagination, and uh, I do the same thing over and over again. So we're we're just doing the same thing over and over again. We're just doing the same thing over and over again. So I'm the bass. Bass. Like in the previous episode, uh, if you haven't watched the earlier episodes, I would recommend uh, going and checking out. Um, so you see, this is this is my uh, see-through guitar for crystal tones. I'm Rain, so I'm the bass. Bass. Because uh, it's, it's a good instrument. It's nice. Um, and so Dev's going like dig a ling a ling, 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 dig a ling a ling. And I'm doing the womp, hence the name of the episode, womp. And uh, basically, it's like a filter sweep that goes on. So it was like, it's, I'm basically trying to find like an electro clash. It doesn't sound like techno at all, but electro is the best idea. Um, song. So it, it, we wanted to try and make things that sounded like synths and stuff like that. So I've got a filter that's going mm -hmm. womp. And it's taking, it's taking what could be a very boring idea and could be a very stagnant idea because we're all playing the same thing over and over 
but it gives it a little bit of movement because it's opening up a bit of excitement. You feel like something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Go on, and talk to me. Tell me how you have achieved this through your pedal board. I'll tell you how I achieved it. And it goes a little something like this. What I did, Lee, uh -huh. was I, I put on my tuner. Uh -huh. Put the, the tuner on uh -huh. the guitar. I tuned the guitar. Uh -huh. Put on my pog. Go on. Made it sound like a bass. Uh -huh. Then I slowly sweep through the filter, low pass filter, sweet sweet filter of the pog. Two. So basically, so it's a bassy sound. Bass. Hold on, I'm going to try and capture the magic of our, our, of our guest here. So we've got making a bassy sound. It's got some octave up and some of the normal octave in it, I think. I can't remember. It's been so long since we've done anything like this. But that gives it a synth yes sound, I think. <laughs> So what I do is I put on the attack. And you heard, do you hear that? That was the filter. Look. Welcome to filter land. So the filter's now in and I, I gradually go through the filter. So I'm just going to ring something out and then show you what essentially happens. No, that didn't sound like much, did it? No. So in order to achieve that on the, the record, actually what we did was reamped it. So I played it first, just perfectly neutral. That was perfectly neutral. Just played that the whole way through, and then I re had it reamped, and then I played the filter. Yes. And in order to achieve that live, what I've done is I've created a set of presets. So it goes like. I'll do it a little bit quicker now. I mean, it was an interesting point. It builds up like that. On the record, obviously, because there's a hand gradually doing it and it's you know it's groovier and yeah. stuff like that. And live, what I'm probably gonna do, right? I told you about this yet. I'm gonna get it my pog modded so that I'm in control of the filter sweep. Either that or I'm just gonna get a low pass filter. I'll probably get a moog low pass filter. But that sounds like the better option. Um because because I'm obsessed with the moog pedals at the minute. And they don't make them anymore, and they're cripplingly expensive. <laughs> so. Again, you don't need to buy all these things. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's not entirely true. There's a lot of Moog sounds that just can't be made by anything but Moog. Yeah. Truly. Or well, like they, they, mean, they uh, really are the best thing at what is they do. Behringer, Behringer are killing it on the fake Moog stuff these days. I yeah. haven't used any of the fake Moog Behringer stuff. Well, they're good. How many have you got? I don't have any of them. Oh, it's lies again. It's not lies. A bucket of lies. Look, I feel like I'm going to have to put up another strip of misinformation. Maybe because we say Behringer so much, maybe some Tom Behringer stuff will come up. Bass. Almost nobody plays it. We just well, that ended there mm. then. But wait, <coughs> hold on. A good, a good point to bring up is whenever I have the effect even more so is on the middle eight bit where it goes. That's right. <laughs> Didn't sound like a change at all there, but it did. And then that preset has changed since the last time I... Uh... And then, as per usual, what we like to do, let's keep it simple. I join you. 
doing the same. Same, but different. So, down below here, I use the evil filter and an expression pedal. I turn it down about halfway, so it makes this little wow. noise. Wow. And then I push it up full on the last one. So Bowen and I are going to do it together. Just gonna Some rain coats for Christmas. 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 So in Model Village, um, we had a thing called an atomic cock. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And well, it, 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 it's funny for like a second, and then you realize like it's like cocked wah, but also like an atomic clock. So, um, basically, it's a cocked wah. So basically, you, you set it. It's like a wah pedal, but it's not a pedal. It's a knob, and you just set it where it's supposed to go. And during the We reamped straight to desk because <laughs> whilst you know having lots of you know amps was good, the sweet sweet sound of straight nice to desk preamp straight to desk lovely. Um, but we uh, so we did that and it was going down it down it and but we changed all the settings. It was like wow 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 wow. Um, so we did that. And that was to make it sound nice, but live, don't have it. Don't have. I don't have an atomic cock, Lee. I do. You don't have an atomic. No, cock, I don't. Lee. It's a lie. I do exactly the same as what I do in Reigns, except um, I just changed the filter setting a bit more extreme, so it has more of a um, uh, range. Range, good word. Reigns again. Evil filter. I'm not going to show you because it's just the same. <laughs> And it's uh, on the same uh, expression pedal. Again, you, you get a bit funky, do you know what I mean? And that's how we do it live. There he is. There, there he is. Do you hear? Do you, do you hear? I am fine. Yeah, that's him. That's him. We've made contact. Um, I, I search for aliens, and um, I, I do, I do the, the searching with uh, the, the, the death by audio even filter. <laughs> There's the filters. Um, Oh, it's so exciting. And then it goes to the intensive care audio, and, and then I... Yeah. They're here? They're here. I, I know, I know they're here. I feel it, I feel it. I feel it. Uh, next song, Lee, that's your, your song, an example where you didn't do the thing that we're about to talk about. <laughs> what was that? In war. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, in war, I do this. And 
that's it. Between the bursts. I am I'm, I'm doing the bursts. Not between the bursts, I'm doing between the, the bursts. Verse. Between the bursts. And that was that was the part really for the for the song. However, when it was in the studio What we did was we copied Warren Ellis. So yeah, like uh, sometimes something sounds really sick when you're in front of an amp, but then when you record it and you listen back to it, you're like, it wasn't as exciting there. Why not? It's because you're not being pummeled with a thousand watts of gloriousness. So we we we, we added this wow to like announce the part. So live, we had to try and recreate that for all yeah. those live shows that we do. Oh uh, yeah, twenty twenty. The year of the live show. Problem is, we haven't quite got it yet, live. It's not working because when you're doing it um, in the studio, you have cutoff points where you, you know, literally a pair of scissors, it stops doing the filter there. And then it goes back to the normal guitar tone that was recorded. Live, it's not as simple as that. So this pedal and this pedal. So this is... All the way open. Uh, would that be open when it's up, and then closed? I think it's. Uh, I, I don't think it we've got it right. Whatever way we've done it, we haven't got it right yet. Probably not. So we set a filter. Nobody's perfect. Um, again, I'm. I'm just going to use the same filter as I've just used, and then we. When as soon as I hit the chord, I smash down. Smash. And that's it. I do a little smash. Smash. So we'll do that. <laughs> Donald Duck. Now, the problem with that is we've got that to begin with, but now we're always Donald Duck. The ideal world here is that I switch the filter off. But when you're in a live situation and I have to do a, a and a switch off, it just sounds a bit shit. What I need is a switching system. Gavin? Oh, I mean, that's the, I tried to find a point where um, the, the first filter noise, this one, so if I turn the filter off, say I want that tone, which I don't right now. I really don't. It's not the tone I want. It's the tone I need, you know? It's the tone, the tone everyone wants. What is this thing? What's this? It's the Line 6 Spider. Set to clean, which is controversial because everyone knows that if you got a Line 6 Spider, set it to insane. There it is. So the point is, what, you, what, what we, we've tried to do is set that this tone on the open uh, filter. <laughs> Whatever, when I spin the dial, it doesn't it's do anything when it's open because it has to be <laughs> shut. <laughs> It's just, it just doesn't sound right. We haven't no. got there yet. We'll figure it out one day. Well, we got, what, another like two years before we tour. So I, I, I reckon I can get it done by then. I, I really want to just switch this to the Brian May setting. Bass.
just filter on that, but uh, so that's uh, that's filters. filters. Lee, do you know who uses filters? Uh, no, mm. not yet, not ready. Oh. Really? Do you want another Give filter that I use? Go on. The intro to love song. We talked about that before. We're not doing that. We're not going back there. What what are we doing? This is the same episode of people. (laughs) Do you know what's not the same? There's an interview with Warren Ellis. I generally, yeah, I don't, I don't do these sorts of things because I have a real phobia about guitar shops and and uh, gear and stuff like that. I just sort of fell into it, you know. Like, I guess I've been curious with sound and stuff like that. But when I started out, I mean, every effect pedal I ever had was given to me, usually by a guitarist that didn't want them, yeah. except my first one, which was like a Fender. Uh, fuzz wah that was like made of cast metal and stuff it was massive and uh my mate in the first band i was in paranoid which was like a kind of acdc black sabbath covers band in ballarat where i grew up he stole it off this guy in the bleeding hearts the bass player his name was reg and and uh we decided to paint his bass guitar one day and uh, it never dried so i think we played like one show at a mcdonald's work breakup you know and uh and tried to play Roadrunner because we we knew how to play Roadrunner, Jonathan Richmond's song, and yeah. we knew how to play uh, Going to Be a Rock and Roll Singer, and we knew how to play Paranoid. And um, it's the only time I ever tried playing a six string guitar, and I, I I'd learn how to play uh, Stairway to Heaven off a guy. He wrote it all down on a toilet roll when I was on one of these survival camps, you know. And um, he wrote he sort of wrote this weird nomenclature down for me, like on a toilet roll. So I, I knew how to play that kind of, but I knew a bar chord shape, but I didn't realize when you crossed over the strings, it went minor. And so for the sort of nine months the band existed, everybody was always throwing stuff at me whenever I went to the kind of big fourth chord, you know, when you drop over, because I'd go minor and no one could work out what was going wrong. I just didn't realize you had to change the shape that it just didn't all kind of, <laughs> you know, work that way. So I kind of, I, I gave up six string guitar when I was about uh, 15 or something, uh, or 16. I never quite understood un- understood the sort of science behind it. And, and I was yeah. learning violin at the time. But um, the bass player stole my first effects pedal, which never worked actually, but it just was so awesome. Like it was big and heavy and chunky and it just looked so cool. So I never actually used it. And then when I started playing violin electrically, I was in a band called Busload of Faith and very quickly formed Dirty Three with Nick and Jim. I didn't have an amplifier or anything because I I, I never had an approach to an electric instrument because I played accordion and flute and violin. So someone told me to get an amplifier, which I did. Um, I don't even know why, but they just said you should get one because then you don't have to play through the, the PA. So I, I got a kind of amplifier and then someone told me I should get a chorus pedal. Well, I didn't, didn't even know what it was. I think the guy who was selling me the amplifier had a chorus pedal. So he gave me that. So the first kind of year that I was playing, I just had a fucking chorus pedal. And then I pulled out this sort of old fuzzwire pedal that I had. And uh, it was Jim White, the drummer from the Dirty Three, who one day come up to me and just said, listen, if you don't throw that off the fucking pier in St Kilda, I'll do it for you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, that chorus is horrible, you know. <laughs> so the first kind of year that, and the first recording we did, I'm, I'm playing through this really souped up kind of chorus. Like, I, I you know, and my relationship to pedals basically stayed the same ever since. Like, people would bring them to gigs. Like, my brother would give me stuff that he didn't want. He had a sonic distortion, which was like an Ibanez, something like that. He would bring that along to the 
gig and people would hand me pedals and I just plug it in and stick everything flat out and see if it worked or if it didn't. So the way that I kind of came to what pedals I was going to use or that defined my sound was literally other people's kindness or getting rid of their rubbish. I'm not sure what it was, but they would just give me these pedals, you know, and then Mick Turner had a um, octave pedal that he was trying to work out a use for because we didn't have bass. And then I'd sort of borrow it and then I'd sort of keep it. And it was this running thing that I just kept stealing his pedals. So I ended up with that and a, and a kind of Dodd EQ because he, he would sort of try distortion pedals and things like that. And I just never had that aptitude. Like I never, I never kind of went into a guitar shop. Like it kind of terrifies me, you know. I, I went into one once in Black Market in San Francisco because someone had stood on mine and broke and I, I gave it to Thurston Moore because he thought it was really funny because it was the whole top had caved in, you know, on this pedal and people were dancing on the stage. And I went into in San Francisco and, and I, I tried a guitar. It was, it was called The Forest Project and it kind of was made out of a root of a tree, you know. It was like some... <laughs> <laughs> fucking grateful dead nightmare or something you know and i and the guy's like what do you want to play through and i'm like well you know give me my rig you know like a, i think i picked out like a, a, a galleon kruger bass head and uh i ended up buying it actually and it belonged to the clash when they were selling all their gear it was their spare um head and it was fucking incredible because it was unbreakable like you could jump on it surf across the stage and stuff like that the wires would fall out the back, but it just like kind of was indestructible. You know, you'd solder it back together. It was like incredible. I gave it away in the end because I couldn't kill it. You know, it was, it was amazing. And I tried out this pedal in this guitar shop and the guy walked up to me and he just goes, can you leave please? And so that was the one time I tried out pedals in a guitar shop. I know I have a lot of crap around. I mean, I, my, my, I have a lot of stuff that's around, you know, like I have things. I mean, I, I have a very small kind of uh, set of skills. It appeared to me over the years, the way to try and stay in the game was to, I guess, expand the palette of sounds that I was making, you know, so I would just grab things and, I, I have suitcases of stuff, you know, that's like my kind of security blanket. But I'm actually, you know, I'm not like a gearhead as such. Like, I'm not a, a pedal file, as uh, some people call me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm not really into that sort of stuff. I love, I, I'm into sound. Like, I, I couldn't tell you a setting that I have on a pedal. I wouldn't know. Like, yeah. if you asked me, well, how's the solo on, I don't know, like, that the sound on No Pussy Blues, you know. I can tell you what I used on it, but it, it's just it's something that happened. And then I have to try and find it out. I never write anything down. I, I don't really pay attention to levels and things. I couldn't tell you where anything is, you know. Like, it, yeah. it, it, it's about sound, really. Like, I just kind of, if I find a sound while I'm doing it, I, and, you know, I sit down, I mean, I can I turn this around? I just threw something together today because I, I can't, everything's in lockup. So, you know, like I just sort of chuck everything to, together in, in some sort of hodge, hodgepodge way. And then I, I, um, I, I just kind of like set things up as they come out of the box in a way, you know, like, and then I settle on a, on a, a sound for a tour or something. Like I settle on a setup, but I mean, I didn't even have a pedal board until about, five years ago and i didn't even have electricity and it was batteries and it was costing like so much money on tour but i just preferred batteries because i'd had bad experiences with power so i've never been that way inclined it's more about finding sounds or something you know that that work for the project or something it's strange because our approach is i mean we're both pedal files i would say yeah but our approach is is very similar like i couldn't tell you exactly what's going on with the pedals that I have but we we just kind of we go into guitar shops and we're like we're always just asking what's the weirdest thing you've got what's yeah. like what's the most unusable thing and then like I've, I've got stuff on my board that I still haven't got a use for yet but I've just I know it's gonna come at some point yeah I mean it's the promise of things isn't it like you kind yeah. of know you know like I mean you sort of know that one day something will happen with it you know, even if it's one thing, I've got like a kind of, this is just in, in the back of my shed, but you know, like I have a, a bunch of stuff. Uh, I, I get sort of given things or I can't, you know, I buy them and stuff like that. But like this, this thing, this kind of, 
Oh, fuck. So you can see how often I get them out. Yeah. This, this one, this colour sound one, which was something that this fuzz, that, that fuzz wire, it was like I was walking, literally walking out of the studio to do a session on Abattoir Blues and it was my wife's and she just said, why don't you try this? And I took it along and plugged it in. The battery was dead and it sounded like a dying cricket and it sounded so awesome. So I just played it on this track. And then I could never play that sound again because my tech kept trying to decharge the batteries, you know, down to like 6.2 volts or something. But they would always get this surge and then kick in when we tried to use this sound live. I can't operate like that, you know, like like a no pussy blue. I remember I had that in and this pedal had this kind of very loose thing at the back and if uh, the, the wire and so if I stood on it hit it really hard it would just sort of like flip up in the up and then fall back down again and make this really cool sound you know like it was just sort of funny and I'd sit there kind of hitting it hitting it with my foot and stuff like that and then stuck my bazooka through it and that became an aspect of no pussy blues this kind of uh thing that if I'd thought about it I wouldn't have come up with it you know yeah, um, that's nuts. Because uh, on one of our one of our tracks on our new album, we had this. Uh, it's got this real like stop start, you know, quiet quiet loud or like loud louder kind of type thing. Yeah. Whenever the guitars were coming in, it felt whenever we were playing it, it's got that real energy where we're going in. But then whenever yeah. we come back, we're like, it's not quite getting that thing. And Nick suggested doing that exact thing, the no pussy blues thing, where the kind of goes. <laughs> kind of oh wow it opens up quick so that on our new album because it's like it works it, it kind of goes you know it explodes out rather than just comes in and it you know it gives you a sense that it's really kind of like popping forward popping out in so yeah actually, that's funny to hear that it's almost accidental that it came in yeah well, a lot of i mean you know, I, I'm a great believer in accidents. Like, you know, I've somehow carved a sort of uh, a career in, in, in making film scores. And, you know, I never knew the first thing about them. And the second one, the proposition, a lot of that was an accident. You know, I had this pedal actually here, this boomerang, which I actually, I do send flowers to the company that made it from time to time because I've got about 20 years, you know, of a creative thing from them. It, it's... Yeah. The most kind of creative looper I've ever found. Um, I bought one recently. Um, it was our sound engineer that recommended it. Cause apparently Sun, the band Sunno, they use them too. Oh, do they? It's so confusing. <laughs> well, it depends which one you get. I mean, this is the, the second one that they did. The sort of more modern one they did is really, uh, it's beyond me. It's, it's Anything that has a manual for me is problematic. Like. I have to be able to just turn it on and something happens or I just like shut the box and I, I, I leave it, you know. And this one, I, 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 Mick Turner actually had one. We were on tour with Dirty Three in America in the 90s and he bought one. I think it was like in the first year that it came out and, and I tried it out and then I realised with it I could make a string arrangement, you know, that, that wasn't uh, possible just being a three piece and we went into the studio and I was able to kind of make these big walls of string sounds, you know, with this boomerang and then live, it was a bit problematic because, you know, we, we like to sort of go in, no messing around and stuff like that. And when I was using it with the bad seeds too, like there's just no way you could sit and wait for someone to build a, a loop. But then, then I worked out that I could make the loops and, and, and uh, just, save them on a this uh jam man and that's that was basically grinder man live was like four of these with loops in and i'd just be jumping around hitting them uh that that was like my contribution to the to the sort of sound was to be playing and to be triggering these things you know with my my feet you know and i know there's bands that play to multi-tracks and stuff like that and yeah. that's the only way to sort of replicate what you've done in the studio but i've just never played in a band like that that's prepared to do that you know yeah. like it's it's about like movement and dynamics and things flowing and stuff like that so you know like it was interesting doing those grinder man records because a lot of them were done in ways without even thinking about how you'd play live 
Um, most of the records that I work on, you know, like Ghostine, you don't think about, or, or Skeleton Tree, you don't think about how you'll do them live. And then when they're done, you're like, oh, now how the fuck do I do it? You know, or how do we play this? You know, and then you work out a way to do it. And there's always a way that you can do it, I think, without using a multi-track. Yeah. Um, but but some of the some of the stuff I, I needed to be able to trigger things, but not that locked everybody in. So those jam mans were really fantastic for that. You know, I'd have I'd have I think I, I had two like Ampeg Ampeg SVTs. I mean, my hearing is destroyed because of yeah. those tours. But um, I had these two Ampeg SVTs and uh, one for the loops and one for my instrument. And so that way I could like kind of trigger stuff like the grinder man loop or you know loops that were the atmospheric things and i could just sort of wang away over it so did you um did you then get your effects and then play to the loop and store it in or did you actually take your desk mix and then run it into the loop? no 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 like i I think with with Grinder Man was the first time we were going so fast with those records. Like we worked pretty fast in the studio, you know, as a rule. But um, they were so quick that up until that point, Lorne had insisted on tape as a way of recording. You know, like he he didn't sort of want to do digital. And doing the score work, I'd only ever worked in Pro Tools, and that allowed us to move in that world in a really kind of much easier way than if we were trying to do it on tape because we were just making it up on the spot you know and, and improvising and that so it allowed us to move things around so grind grinder man was the first time Lorne had a tape running and he had pro tools because he wanted to prove to us that the tape was better and he and after a while he just said i give up i can't we can't keep up you know with the work rate the workflow that was going on so then yeah. we, we switched on to Pro Tools. And what was great about that was these things that I'd made that I hadn't stored, you know, because I didn't, I, did, I hadn't sort of worked out how to store them. They were on a multi-track. So then we could just like pipe them out, you know. So now when I do a tour, like the engineer will just send the multi-track of stuff that was done then. That's sort of, you know, like I can't sort of reproduce it. And then I just put it in a loop station, you know, with the sounds on it. But I'll kind of mix different stems together or something, or um, they're usually affected uh, if they're affected. And I don't really go through distortion with that stuff at that. I don't think at that point, I mean, I don't really use distortion that much. Like the violin is, is I don't know. It's, uh, it has a, I guess it's, it has different sort of frequencies to a guitar and that. So quite often pedals that work for me don't work for guitarists, yeah. you know, like- I was gonna I, I say can't... about like, violin that that must be difficult with distortion because it must feed back and just well i really like that actually you know i i like yeah. i mean i've never used an electric violin because it contains it i tried one once that tony cohen had stolen from a session that he was working on and uh he, he was trying to sell it to me on the cheap and then i realized it was hot and uh and it was terrible you know like it was just so contained yeah. The thing that I loved about the violin when I plugged it in was you could feel the body vibrating. And I knew that if I moved in a certain spot, it would just take my head off and it would feed back and stuff like that. So the kind of danger of that was always really thrilling. And, and the, with the violin, I just have a pickup that's plugged straight in. So it's a straight hot signal. There's no volume. I can't wind anything off it. You know, I just have yeah. to work with it. So I really, I really like that aspect of it. And it's why I kind of move around a lot on stage too, because it's yeah. sort of with 33 because it kind of, you know, you get a bad spot and stuff like that. Like it, it all keeps it unpredictable. Yeah. Um, I, I really like that, that sort of aspect of it. Yeah, each venue, each uh, stage, no matter what, there's going to be one spot in a different place where you just. Can't. Yeah. No, you just, you just never know, you know, so you just have to sort of work with it. The loop so for me that boomerang for instance like i remember doing the proposition that score and it was the first time that i realized that i could kind of like make these atmospheres and things like that you know i've continued to work on ever since and i remember i'd spoken to bobby gillespie about the making of uh jesus the mary chain album and i was like how the fuck did they get that sound you know that that I remember when it came out in the 80s, you know, like sound systems in houses were so variable. It was just like any amplifier with like any turntable, any set of speakers that you'd found in the street or whatever. 
And no matter what party you went to, that album always sounded unbelievable. And I remember Bob, he said to me, I don't remember too much about that, but I remember that they, they recorded different amplifiers playing the same stuff through it and sort of wove it in and out. And I remembered that when I went in to do the, the proposition. So I took in like three amplifiers, like my amp, a really small one that was battery operated and a, a bass amp. And, and a, then there was a DI, so we had four signals. And then we, with that little information that he'd given me, we just started blending the sounds in and out and realized that doing a really minimal thing by blending these different sounds in, you had the impression that something was happening. Yeah. And then I just kind of continued using them to this day in the studio. Probably everything I've ever done has gone through that boomerang. Those, I have two of them. They have a, they have a beautiful thing you can do with the reverse thing. There's this beautiful bass sound on the proposition, this really kind of like chugging sort of sound. And I just accidentally tripped on the pedal and, and it turned into a reverse, because I don't read the instruction, but it made this really great delay, reverse delay sort of thing. And when Marty was sort of playing the bass string, it just become this like really cool thing. But it, it was literally because I hit the thing accidentally and twice, like if you do a, have you tried that out on yours? Uh, honestly, Ryan, <laughs> I've done exactly what you said. I took it out of the box. I plugged it in. I Which one have you got? The newest one. Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 left that, I left that somewhere. I played like two notes through it and I was like, oh, okay, okay. I understand. It's playing my notes. And then I went to play something over the top of it and it, it just span out and wouldn't play the thing from before. It stopped and then did this other thing and played something else and I was like, what, what is going on? And then I put it away. Yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I got one, I got one of the, that model, but, but I, I know I got it out and had the same experience, you know, like it just wasn't intuitive. Like, oh, yeah. and when, when you have to bend down and touch things too, like it sort of gets in the way of stuff. But this one, the phrase sampler plus it's called, it's the second one that they did. They've done three models and, uh, this has, you can do two things in it, but it has the most beautiful kind of reverse and you can stack stuff and then you can drop it down a fourth or an octave or a fifth and stuff like that. Okay. And like, you know, I mean, you can, hang, wait, hang on. Yeah. I remember just sitting there going like, uh. Anyway, that, that was the Grinder Man riff. It was yeah. just like uh, viola. Um, I was probably playing it faster now, but from memory. But so, you know, like, it, it, I, I love these drop down things on this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's really cool. So I was probably like trying to play like, you know, Ramon song or something like that, like on the violin and, and hit this thing and turn it on. Is it, is it just slowing it down and then is it, is it, it's dropping it as well, yes? Yeah. Anyway, you know, like it, it drops it down an octave. I mean, it's just, you know, for me, it, it, that boomerang allowed me to just kind of make stuff up on the spot in such a really creative way, you know. Um, yeah. Because yeah. coming into a band playing a violin, you just play a melody and stuff like that. And, and I, I guess I was trying to find ways to keep my job, you know, like... Um, so that boomerang, that was like a kind of revelation for me. I basically built a big slab of my career on it, you know, like yeah. it. It's cool that it like, it'll take an idea that you've got and just transform it into something else. Yeah. Because like, I, well, I, I get that a like lot gifts, where I'm like, you know? I, can hear, I can hear the idea and it sounds good to me, but whatever is coming out isn't translating well. And then it's just like, if you try it in this different way, or you're forced into a different, in a different way of hearing it, it, just, it sounds better like that. Yeah. And then this other thing that I really love is called the Holy Stain, that this thing here, um, I, I just discovered that 
that was an, again by accident all our gear got stuck somewhere in america with a bad seeds tour and so i had to go and it wasn't turning up for the concert so i had to go down and like rebuy an approximation of what i had and i went in the shop and it, and at the time i just had these old 80s pedals you know and stuff that i just sort of found along the way and it was just this one music shop and they had this pedal it's like a hundred dollars but our gear turned up and then i found this in a box after because we couldn't return the stuff and it actually ended up being really as kind of influential for me as that boomerang because it gave me a, a, a way of shifting things you know again you know going back like having limited skills and stuff like that it's how you can sort of shift it around you know and so like the the beautiful thing with this like i can't tell you how much time oh fuck this is my thumb you know so like this has a kind of shifter on it a distortion and stuff like that so you can so you can go up a fifth or down a fifth which is really beautiful and, and then you can sort of like you know, I can wind in something else that I've got going on. It's got a tremolo in it, reverb and stuff. I never used to use anything like reverb. It was sort of sounded like the 80s to me at the time. Yeah. You know, like I just, I never went near them and then I actually realized it was useful for some things like not so long ago. Uh, <laughs> I started working more just on the computer, like making scores and things like that. The last one I did, I recorded mostly on trains, you know, and I would just sit on the train with my laptop and kind of a little synth and a sound card and a bunch of loops and stuff like that. And while I was doing Ghost Dean, I'd sort of get the Eurostar over and, and it was a documentary on women who train hop. So I, I just sort of sat in the train on the Metro and stuff and, and kind of recorded the whole thing pretty much like you know then mix it in a studio and then the one but another one i did before that i wanted to see if i could do one on tour with dirty three so i just did it in hotel rooms mix it on the plane and handed it in and like 90 percent of it was 70 well, percent of it was kind of like all right and i had to kind of mix mix the other part but it was around then you know that i realized reverb was useful <laughs> When I go in the studio, I kind of have this thing that the first thing I do generally tends to be something that works for some reason. So while I'm setting up, I will kind of get an idea going just to kind of get everything checked with, you know, like so they can get levels and stuff like that. And then I go, okay, let's put it down. And nine times out of 10, it's like something, you know, like it's usable for something. Um, I'm sort of a bit superstitious about that. <laughs> um. Actually, actually, what I, I should show you too is, is uh, if this is of any interest to you. The other way I used to get pedals was my brother would make them for me. And this was the pedal that I used on the first Grinder Man record uh, and the second Grinder Man record and Dig Lazarus Dig. And I, I use it live as well with, with, uh, for a couple of songs. You know, get it on that song. Yeah. That was like, that was like. Uh, no, he's gone. He's gone. He might come back. Okay, so my brother gave me that pedal and he made out of like old transistor radios and stuff that he got in fifth shops and stuff like that. And he downloaded schematics and things like that and worked out how to build pedals. And um, he gave me that one. And then I just started getting into these four stringed instruments. This was like some hundred pound, uh, what is it? Kentucky, a uh, 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 Mando caster. And I had like, um, I had like, um, I had, a, uh, it was like, I had, I had a mandolin somewhere. I don't know what happened to it. I had a, oh, what's this? Yeah, 
No, no, that's mine. I had like a, this is an awesome one. Check that out. This is my finest work there. So, oh, wow. Yeah, you need one of those. Idols that's need one of those. Oh, hang on. Anyway, that thing and, and uh, that, that uh, this pedal, that was what I used for Get It On. And uh, I was just sitting in my in the attic in my house. That was that was my original studio. And I started messing around with it. And I recorded it and sent it to Nick. And he just called me up and he's like, "Oh man, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard." You know, like that's sick. And then you know, I took it in the studio. I had it on. I'd saved it on a loop. And we sort of built the track on that kind of thing. But this little box, that's like the best sort of distortion thing I've ever had. Actually, um, it's very inside it's just like about three transistors and a, a little uh i mean they're, they're really they're really brutal and beautiful inside do you want to see inside it yeah sure. it's beautiful to see how little there is in them yeah i love that i love when i look in a pedal and there's like it's just like two parts and it's your favorite pedal and it costs you three yeah pounds. yeah <laughs> this 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 one is yeah look at this this is awesome it's like this kind of it's just like this kind of thing, jump dancing around in there with a couple of <laughs> things on it. Tech's nightmare. I think it's the reason I don't like pedal boards is that it, it sort of um, in the studio because it sort of locks you into something. And I did. I remember doing a session with Richard Russell. Um, at, I must say I don't I haven't used distortion for a long time. I bought a synthesizer and then that kind of sent me somewhere else. You know, like it's sort of. Yeah. Uh, you know, I still like having an overdriven sound for Dirty Three, and and uh, there's aspects of the Bad Seeds that I sort of like to kick kick things in. But um, I kind of moved away from that. I think the sort of Grinder Man records got that out of my system in a way. Like yeah. there was something, you know, and and the early days of Dirty Three were so loud, like and so like volatile on stage, you know. And that was just, you know, like I had a hot cake, I think, and a and a DOD overdrive. Most of the stuff would just, I'd have it all on 10, you know, I just wound everything out all the way around, you know, like I didn't, I, I remember it was in a studio actually that someone came up and said, you know, you can roll the, the tone back on that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It was like this dot octave pedal. I think it was Steve Albini actually, when we were doing ocean songs. And he's like, you know, you can, you can wind that back off a bit if you want you know like it was like a kind of revelation you know that you could sort of like turn these things back that they just didn't they didn't do that thing we're, we're exactly on. the same we've got like all our guitars are just the bridge pickup no tone control so yeah every single pedal is like on 10 like our yeah. sound engineers like can you do it quieter and it's just like well if you make it go to 10 you gotta go to 10 don't you like it's yeah that's like, the that's the level yeah, I, I uh, designed a tenor guitar and, and the sort of principle of that was that it was like my violin, you know, that it just had a volume and a tone, but no, not even like another pickup or anything like that, you know, just a bridge pickup. Because I, I kind of figure that changing it with your feet is better. It makes more sense. I don't know. Like I, I would always like wind the master volume up to 10 on the amp and then bring up, I didn't go for the overdriven. I just sort of, for some reason in my head, I thought if everything at the start was loud, you're off to a good start. Like there was something solid about it. Like I, I have no logic or understanding of it at all, actually, of the, the way that it works. But um, yeah, when, when, I'm, when I designed that tenor, the idea of that, that was, it was really just a volume thing that you, you put up and that was it. And then you, you just kind of work with that, you know, like. I mean, to me, that makes a lot of sense. My brain works the same way. Well, they, they say that an EQ on an amp, if your treble, mid and bass is all turned to 10, then the amp is at its absolute EQ. Yeah, right. It wasn't designed that way. It just works out that way. That once they're all full, they're working at their full fullest capacity. Nothing is restricting them whatsoever. So if everything's at 10 and the volume's at 10, the amp is completely in its natural state. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... It I'd say it makes sense. I mean, I don't really know, but I got, I, actually, I know that um, Lixa Bargol, when he played in the Bad Seeds, he had a certain setup with a Fender Twin. You know, he liked a certain set of speakers in it and stuff like that. It was really heavy. 
but he had everything at midday like he that that's where it kind of all worked for him you know there was some and i mean i've never heard anything sound like his guitar like i said i don't do this sort of thing it's because actually you have to find your place in that world and and what anybody says about it is not relevant to you at all you know like the important thing is find your way in i mean the greatest lesson for me, I think, was just people giving me stuff and trying it out and seeing what happened. You know, rather, I didn't have a sound to copy. Like, I wasn't trying to sound like Kurt Cobain or something because I couldn't, you know. Like, I had a violin and, and I was trying to find a sound. And I think the thing that I'd say to anybody that might even be vaguely interested is that it's about finding your own thing in anything at any level, you know, whatever it is, you know, you, you start off with trying to imitate things, but when you really start just looking for your own thing, that's when it gets really exciting. And, and yeah, yeah I, I just would encourage anybody to, you know, don't go out and buy something because somebody's got it, you know, like yeah. just um, because, you know, it's like you, you, you write a song and it sounds like the cure and you're like, awesome. It sounds like the cure. And you're like, yeah, and you know, like yeah. no, no, one, no one cares about that. No one, no one wants anyone to sound like the Cure other than the Cure. And then when you're yeah, exactly, yeah, you, you, know, you just want them to sound like that. And and and, but it's great. It's a great way to learn um, how to do things and and realize stuff. But it's then you have then eventually take a step away from that, and that's where it gets really exciting. But to actually get to that place, you have to. I mean, you know, like you have to sort of cover things. <laughs> I'm as amazed as anybody that I've been doing this 30 years. You know, I still don't get it, but uh, for some reason I am, you know, I don't know if it's because, because uh, I've been curious or, or what I've, I've been, a, had great people around me that, you know, I, I love the power of a group. I love that sort of what a group gives you. It gives you this sort of security to the trust and the confidence that's in that. Like it's so important. Like, a great you know you know what it's like yourselves you know when you're on stage uh and the group and you look around you see those people and stuff and that thing that clicks in like that's powerful yeah yeah that's really powerful there's, there's, no, there's nothing like it i mean no i mean i'm a team i'm a team person in a way you know like i mean when i go off on my own i uh, I miss other people and also I need other people to inform me, you know, or, or sort of like give an opinion or contribute or for me to contribute to them. I feel the same. It's like, as, as soon as I'm on my own, I just start overthinking. Uh, I, like I'll write something. I'll be like, I don't know. I don't know if this is good. I'll keep going. And this, this lockdown time provide like gave me a lot of time of writing on my own. And then I'd be too afraid to share it with the group because I'd sat on it for so long. Right. I just wasn't even sure if anything was good. So like that, that team mentality for me is, is just completely key. That being in the room and, and like feeling the energy of the others around me, it just, it, that's what grows an idea inside me. I think, yeah, I and mean, the, like, we're so brutal with each other. We're like the best creative filter ever because like, if something's knock our legs, we don't even give it an opportunity to try and get legs, you know, it's just like, nah, it's not going to Well, work. you don't have time. Yeah. I mean, you have to trust that within each other and, and you have to leave that kind of ego at the door in a way. It's yeah. uh, something, it's, it's, it's just innate, you know, you see this thing that goes on and, and, and that has filters and that has, you know, it's, it's, it's a history, but yeah, it, it's, it's a tricky thing, uh, you know, just to rewind. It is, it's a funny thing when you present something because it, it can be actually quite intimidating. But when you have the sort of the, the trust of the other people that you know you can go off and if they go like, oh, I don't think that's shit, like it's okay, you know, because you within that, in that thing you can do that. It's not so crushing or something like that, you know. Well, you get that. At the beginning, it's very crushing because you're like, wait, hang on. I've worked really hard. And then after a while, you're like, okay, no, right, let's keep moving. This is this, you know, dissolution. Of this. Yeah. We can do this together. I don't know. I don't know for, for how you find it, but I, I often find the things I've worked on ended up, end up actually being not very good. And then I just, just sort of stumble across, you know, stumble on something 
or the thing that I just think has got no legs at all, suddenly it's like kind of there, you know, like it's working and stuff like that. And yeah. sometimes overthinking is an, is the enemy, you know, like it's it yeah. sort of like, and, and or you sort of like get so enamored with something that you can't actually see what's going on with it. That's like a, one, of the, one of the guys we work with is this hip hop producer called Kenny Beats. And in uh -huh. his studio, he's just got this massive neon sign next to where you're working and it's don't overthink shit. Right. And he's just like, anytime anyone starts to have that kind of conversation, he just like points up at it and just goes, let's move on. But when I, when I got into the bad seeds, you know, that was a really set up thing and established and stuff like that, you know, and, and so like mo moving in, moving into that was, was a different thing again, because, you know, there was opinions, there was like kind of, you know, it was a band that I just absolutely like adored. Like I thought it was, you know, like such a fantastic band. And then I suddenly found myself playing with them and, and, you know, I, I had to w work out like how to sort of, fit into something that was you know like seemingly constructed and not you know because they were always trying to change what was going on with each record so i had to sort of i was kind of like running around in the wilds for a few years you know with dirty three just like kind of like everything was on you know and it was actually great at, at that point for me to be sort of reined in a bit to a a kind of, I mean, there was so much going on in, in with the bad seeds, but it was what you didn't do that was actually the, the big thing. It was actually about the space and stuff like that. Letting each other breathe. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, yeah, let, letting actually everything breathe, you know, just let, letting letting everything kind of, just let, letting everything find its space kind of thing. I'm loving that we worked on this theory for the recent album and uh it was it was new to us to be so in, engrossed in this in this theory of, of letting things breathe allowing space and holding back and we're we're applying it more and more as we go forward and it, and it really works but the more like this is new to us however yeah everyone that we've spoken to recently have all said the exact same thing and it just feels so good to be well i th I, th I think path yeah, I mean, I think to have a life in this sort of thing, you have to try different things out. You know, like there's a there's at, at a point when you start out, maybe you just want to play the loudest shit you've ever heard and you want to do this certain thing. But by the end of a tour, you might think, okay, maybe we might want to try something else, you know. And, and uh, I think it's just the sort of natural cycle of the creative cycle, you know, to find these ways in that other people have, have found to just keep you know it's just all grist to the mill you know like it's i remember with 33 doing that we, we did a record called horse stories and the tour was just like you know it was like i mean you know, I've, this is i've still got the drum kit from that tour here it is this drum kit that's my blood all over it still like nobody's it hasn't jim left it here and uh, uh we got that in San Francisco in 1995 when we first left Australia uh, and uh, yeah that's all my blood still all over the skin and um, I remember like when we did that tour like I, I was in hospital I, I, you know like I, I thought I had a heart attack and blah 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 anyway when we got back into the studio to kind of make a record uh, after that we had no ideas and and we, the only idea we had was like, let's make a record that the loudest thing is Jim's snare drum. You know, when we record it, because we, we were in a rehearsal room trying to make up ideas and we were like, okay, we have to turn our amps down so that we can hear what he's playing because there was no PA. And then we went in with Albini and did Ocean Songs. And the premise of that record was just to sort of like switch around from the sort of, just that sort of, thing that we've been doing for a few years you know since we started just like big dynamics loud and like just sort of like you know fucking over the cliff sort of thing and then I remember, I remember actually making that record about two days in we hadn't listened we had four days because we could only ever afford our first record was done in one day our second record was done in four days and the, the producer never turned up so it was really done in about one day by the engineer and Ocean Songs, we had enough money to, to have four days in the studio with Albini. And um, after about day two, we thought we'd listen back. You know, we were, it was on tape. 
we listened back and we all just got the fright of our life and just said like, fuck, it all sounds the same. It's terrible, you know, like shit, you know, like we panicked, you know, because I guess it wasn't what we'd done, you know, and it was unknown. And, and then Steve stepped in and he said something that I've actually like held on to ever since. He just said, look, can I say something at this point? And uh, we said, yeah, please. And he goes like, you came in here, you asked me to make a record. I've seen you live uh, several times. And he said, I thought we were going to make like the greatest rock and roll album since Raw Power. You came in here and you said, we want to make a quiet record. And I must admit, I was disappointed, but it's your record. And who am I to say? He said, all I would say to you now is you had an idea when you came in. Don't forget it. And so we went out and finished that record like that, you know, like if he'd said something like, oh, fuck, thank God, you know, like this is like, Jesus Christ, this is, this is terrible. But he could see the kind of the, the fear that we had about it, you know, and, you know, when people say it's all right, you know, fear is good and all this, like it, it, it's also overwhelming in the studio sometimes because it's foreign and, you know, all these aphorisms that people tell you, you know, about, uh, you know, kill your darlings and blah, 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 like this, you know, but like, when you're in the moment, you only have the moment to sort of go by. And, and I remember that with him because we continued on in that way. And, and it was a much stronger thing to do than to just go and turn everything up to 10 and bash it out, you know, yeah. like we would have done. Because you can play any song any way you like. It's the, it's the choices that you make. And, and I think they're sort of like little they're tests that the creative process puts up to you, you know, like, okay, what are you going to do next? What will you do? How will you find your way in? But that thing Steve said, I, I think about that a lot. Um, remember what you went in there to do. Like you can change, but remember what you went in there to do because the sort of unknown can make us quickly revert to something that we know as opposed to something we don't know. He seems so clever and so like, mm, there's no ego to anything that he does. It just seems like he's like, there for the like it, it's such a there for the band and like he so he seemed to be very receptive there like what, what you're describing to to what you were actually looking for and I've heard that off so many different people from him that he's kind of uh, it seems like all the best producers are that that they're kind of they're receptive not just to what the band are saying but like what they're intending I guess I mean Albino is there to he says you know I'm just here to, to get down what you want to do you know, he's, he's there and, and I remember he said, you know, I, I can make suggestions if you want. I'm not a producer, but I can, I'll give you my opinion if, if you want. Um, I, I've never worked particularly well with, uh, I, actually, I've, I've hardly ever worked with producers as such that want to kind of do a certain thing. Because even if we don't know what we're doing, we feel like we have a better idea than anybody else anyway. Well, I have to say, I've, en I've enjoyed this and it's why I, I thought I'd do it because I, I, I remember doing an interview for a guitar magazine or something, you know, like, and it's sort of preposterous because I, like, I'm, I'm neither of the, any of those things, you know, and like I said, my relationship to this stuff is purely about the sound. Like, I don't have a, a thought of where things go or anything like that. I mean, basically, you go in the studio with me and this, that's kind of what it looks like, you know, it's just like, I'll have a lot of crap just lying around and cables everywhere. And I have no, you know, there's no sort of sense to it um, or logic. There's a few things I, I might put into a certain line, but, but the, it changes. Like I remember doing a session with Richard Russell and he was, it was, his stuff was more sort of hip hop and things like that. And I was like, fucking no idea what to do. So I, I, he opened the door and I went up the stairs and as I was walking up the stairs, I thought, I know I'll set everything up backwards. So I set up all my gear backwards, like the way I wouldn't. And it suddenly allowed me to sample myself in a way that I, I hadn't been able to do, you know, like I could sort of like just do these samples and things like that. I mean, I'm much more about the kind of the approach than actually the, 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 it's almost like thinking about the approach, you know, um, what can I do or, or, or how, how will I, do, how will I set up or what? 
and then and I guess it's why I don't really have anything locked down you know like it's all just kind of I'll buy something if I anything if I think I can get one idea out of it you know like my like my uh, this is this is just sort of where I work at home but like you know I've got like this is I've got like Vietnamese instruments and I've got like a slide and this is a this is a awesome thing that, uh this is like what I got like kind of, this is a Hona guitarette. This was like made in uh, the fifties. Hona tried to sort of invent this thing to uh, take the guitar crazed by storm. This is what I use on Jesse James and, and uh grinder man used this through a distortion pedal. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's on chain of flowers and it's on uh electric Alice and I'll, I'll grab sounds off that, you know, that I've, I've looped up and, you know, I mean, I just have, uh, I'll, bu I mean, this isn't even, you got I just have 808. Yeah. There's that one. That's yeah. There's the, one of those. Um, I, to be honest, I, I haven't really plugged that in, uh, you know, as a banjo, I mean, I have a lot of synths. Yeah. That's a ten. I have a tenor guitar and stuff like that. I have like, that's the only guitar I bought. That guitar for grinding me. Oh, so it's gonna lose his mind. He Look loves, at that man. That's the flying V. Uh, that, okay. that is the exact flying V I've been dreaming of. Like, get, get the phone. One hundred pounds guitar gack in Brighton. Amazing. Oh, yeah. That's uh yeah. There's a uh, Mickey Mouse and the Goodbye Man. That, that, that was one question I, I wanted to ask was. So like my, my wife bought me a, a viola for um, my birthday. Oh, beautiful instrument. And I like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I get, I got used to the, the fifths rather than the, the, the fourths. Yeah. And stuff like that. It seems like, do you, do you find that going up in fifths disturbs your, your kind of flow? Is that why you stick with four strings more often than not? No, I mean, basically what happened, I learned violin as a kid um, and I, I learned a bit of guitar, but then, so I had a head, I, my, musically, I think in fifths, you know, in the strings. So the fourths, yeah. I just don't get it, particularly the last two strings. I just don't get on a guitar. Like they, yeah. I don't, I, 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 I don't know, like, you know, I, I started violin when I was about, 10 years old and um when i found um a friend told me there was a mandocaster for sale in brighton and i went and had a look at it and it was this tiny little they're sort of like um fender made them in the 50s and they're kind of oh, i have one here they're like a sort of uh they're like this this little things like that yeah 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 i've seen they're, that they're that that's like you know what I use on uh, Honey Bee and it's the pretty much the first the Grinder Man album when I was it was that sort of stuff like Nick was playing the six string he was laying out the chords and I was do, you know like doing stuff you know like the sort of more lead things and stuff like that on that because it was the first time I was actually able to play an instrument in that position um, the violin like that but those that that tuning of strings enabled me to sort of you know eventually get a tenor guitar which my brother found for me in australia some guy built it in his garage out of a kitchen table top and um and it, you know like it was like a couple of hundred dollars and um it had the tuning that i understood i never thought of tuning a guitar in in fifths you know like i'd never yeah. thought of that and taking two strings off because you always had that weird spot. But when I got those four strings, um, you know, the, the, that sort of set up on, on a guitar, I could suddenly apply some sort of thing that I had to the violin tuning into that playing that way. And then I was able to sort of look at playing some chords and stuff like that, you know, that I never did before. I mean, I love the viola. The viola is really fantastic. Like I, I, I've got one of those that I kind of um, used a lot around Grinder Man, like that first. I used to have that and dig Lazarus dig and, and that because it, it was sort of so low and sounded so awesome, you know, like through yeah, a pedal. I, I love that kind of like. 
it's a beautiful woody sound like it's really amazing and if you stick a pog on it or something like that it sounds incredible you know like it's you can go so low uh the frequency but um we need to bring that to your next next writing session yeah it's 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 i don't know like i i i am a believer in like kind of um for me what works is to grab something that i really don't know much about and then try and get something out of it i have to show you this actually you know this this is this is probably one of the most beautiful things this guitar. Oh, you see that? Wow. I mean, that is the most, one of the most metal things oh, I've ever word. seen. So this, look, look at this. I have never seen it like it. No, you won't. This, 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 uh... <laughs> it's unreal. So this, the guy that made this, um, this was to put goldfish inside. What? Those clear tanks, they screw off and you could put, you're meant to put goldfish in there. And it's made by this guy who like is, he's, he's dead now. He, his name was uh, Dominic V-Line and these are called V-Line guitars. Uh, they are, they're, they're actually the only guitars I, I, I kind of have, I care about, but um, he made this beautiful sword guitar that Johnny Thunders used briefly in photo shoots and stuff. And he was this French guy who, just like an absolute genius, who wrote his own kind of Bible and invented these characters. And each guitar has a character on the back from this book that he wrote. And um, he would never sell them. He would meet the person somewhere, like he'd say, meet me at this place. And the guitar would be buried under a pile of straw or it would be like kind of like hidden somewhere. And he would say, this is for you, but, um, and I don't want money, but if I ever get in trouble trying to pay my gas bill, will you help me out if you can, you know, like he'd go into these sort of verbal contracts and uh, he, he, um, everything is hand built on that, those guitars. Yeah. And um, they're, they're sort of really whacked out and sort of pretty impossible to play, but just so beautiful. He inspired my friend, James Troussard, who makes the metal guitars in, in, in LA French guy. And um, he eventually designed this, um, flying machine that you would plug the guitar in and playing the guitar would make it fly. And um, he tried to get it passed by the French aviation, you know, like the, the sort of, he had these plans for it. Anyway, they sort of like, he went off, the, went off the rails and he was certified and ended up just like killing himself in the Institute. But he, he's, I mean, he's someone, he deserves like some kind of some film or something about him. It's just yeah. amazing, you know, like a, a amazing. And they're just the most beautiful instruments, like um, actually objects. They're, they're incredible, you know, like, yeah, his name's V, it's called V-Line, V-L-I-N-E. It sounds like he's almost like the pinnacle of what we've been, we've been discussing about like relinquishing any kind of control over things or like yeah. any idea just feeding into the the ideas rather than yeah. any preconceived notion of anything that's, that's yeah it always he it, exactly that yeah he so it's like it's sort of pure creation for him you know um you know i i you know i i i've never bought it an in anything based on its brand or whatever it's about how it sounds to me you know like or how much money i've got you know like I bought violins outside of train stations on tour because mine's been sat on by a bus driver or something, you know, like I've, I've never, you know, e even now, you know, like when, when I, when I could kind of like afford, I mean, like I have an amp that sounds good and that, and I have gear and that for touring, of course, you know, but 
um, still my, you know, my violins cost, you know, a couple of hundred quid or something like that. A lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff is just so sort of like, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, like I just, I always remember actually the, the, the schematic of the best pedal board I ever saw was Angus Young. It's just like an amplifier and a guitar. Yeah. That's the dream. Yeah. 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 Yeah.